I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Steve Firth to discuss his paper, An Assay on the Axioms of First Contact. Steve has a bachelor's and master's in philosophy from the University of Lethbridge in Alberta, Canada, and for the last six years has been a PhD candidate in philosophy through the University of Helsinki. Steve's work includes research into the practical applications of the picture theory of disability, experience teaching philosophy, logic, and research methodologies at the Southern Alberta Institute of Technology as part of the core education program, and volunteer work as an awareness advocate for cancer screening and early detection. So Steve, welcome. Today, we are going to drill down on the axioms of first contact. And before anything else, I think that we should launch right into your presentation that you prepared on it. And then we can come back with kind of a question and answer session after that. Perfect. Thank you very much for having me on, Tim. I'm looking forward to having a chat later on. This topic is kind of, it's a, it's a little left field for me, but it's, it's become a, an area of, of, of passion, really, um, uh, because I am a futurist and I'm interested in, in uh, technology and the future, this sort of first contact stuff. And I'm a big Star Trek fan, so of course that's a... Um, uh, a motivator, but these are kind of very interesting questions, and I don't feel they've been really uh, looked into properly. So, uh, I think the 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 beginning of this whole presentation and this notion started when I I watched Star Trek: uh, Strange New Worlds, the, the new series that came out I think last year, um, and and in it there was this opening line. It said that first contacts with aliens always live squarely in the impossible. First contact is is just a dream. And the problem with that is that it remains a dream until one day it isn't. And the, there's, there's a number of times in, in the past when humanity has sort of identified this never occurring thing as being impossible or years and years and years away. And the reality is that it tends never to be that. Einstein, for instance, uh, had he, he argued that there was no chance of us ever becoming nuclear uh, powered or, or, or nuclear controlled. And, and, he, and he said that um, only eight years before we launched the, the first nuclear bomb. So like these things do have a habit of appearing right out of the blue, like, uh, I suppose, like COVID. So my worry is that there's a tremendous amount of material on uh, on various aspects of first contact, but nothing of which is substantial. It's all kind of cursory stuff about the Fermi paradox and, and, and this will happen or this won't happen and so on and so forth. And it really guides... Uh, it really guides the research, the academic research, and the and the community research in a way that's not very helpful. So uh, we can we can say for for sure that the the discussion of actual first contact, you know, the academic discussion of first contact, by which I I, I mean to distance from um, uh, from the, the the science fiction sort of first contact uh, is is dwarfed almost entirely by the Fermi paradox. You had on the show uh, just a, a, a little while ago, Kent Peacock, who of course was advocating for for some resolutions to the Fermi paradox. And if you look at the material um, of the Fermi paradox, uh, it basically identifies it, it a whole aspect that has been done to death. But it it looks at large numbers for the Drake equation, and we can see this here on the right of the screen is the Drake equation, but basically N, which is the number of civilizations that are, uh, you know, advanced, uh, is massive. And a, and a recent um, a recent document, which I've cited here, uh, says that the odds of a civilization developing on a habitable planet uh, are less than about one in 10 billion trillion, which is a stupid number you know it's it's one of those one of those mathematical figures that's just you can't get your head around you know too many noughts and all that kind of stuff and and this is the problem so so the fermi paradox looks at this massive figure and it, and it says well how come we haven't seen any evidence of of extraterrestrial intelligence and and what happens of course is that uh the science and philosophy community are, are busy trying to resolve 
the, the paradox here, trying to, well, why is this the case? Uh, without actually thinking about, well, what happens, you know, next week if Ethis suddenly appear on the horizon? And this is a problem because, of course, all of this focuses on the absence of evidence. But as as has been repeatedly noted in the past, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Uh, and so we're not preparing for first contact in a, in, a, in a useful or important way. And we can say from recent research by, uh, I think this is from uh, uh, Seth Baum, that, um, or even Seth Shostock, I can't remember which Seth now, but there, there's uh, conservatively calculated that first contact will happen sometime within the next five years, which is, which is, like tomorrow in terms of in terms of the planet, you know. So uh, what am I trying to say with this? Well, the, the problem is that if we if we keep discussing why there is no first contact and, and what possible reasons and justification there are for no first contact, we're not actually developing any processes of, of what to do if first contact happens within this next five years or or within the next 10 years or, or, or whenever it is, because we have no systems and no policies and no thinking about this. And, and what has resulted from worldwide global events uh, such as COVID is that we, we realize we're really rubbish uh, dealing with like massive global phenomena, like properly rubbish. We have zero capacity. We have no cohesive thought. We've got no mechanism of intergovernmental discussion. We have no policies. We've got no thinkers that are geared towards global catastrophe. We've got nothing. And here's everybody talking about, well, it's never going to happen because and here's why it's never going to happen. And, and, in, and instead, what we really need to be doing is actively pushing towards getting this thinking into gear so that we can actually put some proper effort into trying to to come up with practical applications and policies and stuff that will help us guide what we're thinking so if we take a quick look at what kind of thing extraterrestrial life looks like we can we can sort of start the process by which we kind of um to narrow down the realities uh, without thinking in terms of, you know, science fiction and stuff, which is a great tool to help uh, stretch the mind in order to consider potentiality. But sometimes it becomes a little um, anthropocentric. As you can see, the, the background image here is another screenshot taken from a Star Trek film. But uh, you'll notice they're all humanoid kind of creatures, and, and this is a sort of what's now become known as the Star Trek fallacy that there are that these uh, extraterrestrial life is going to be a bit like us in <laughs> bipedal and all of that kind of stuff, and that's not necessarily true. So what can we say? Well, the Rio scale uh, was developed as a mechanism to kind of prioritize and uh, rate the signal and, and information to give a likelihood of that being related to extraterrestrial life. So it it has a process by which it uh, can delineate the class of phenomenon and and uh, the discovery type, you know, what kind of what kind of emission, what kind of um, example of of uh, received signal or received evidence uh we discover uh, Ethi by. And of course, it also uh, relates to distance, which is something I think we'll we'll chat about later on because distance is quite important. I think the nearest habitable planet is about four light years away. And so we've got a bunch of, uh, well, technically habitable, we've got a bunch of, uh, you know, uh, distance related stuff that's important to talk about. So the problem with the Rio scale is that it's actually quite constrained in that it it's in, in a, bit like some of the thinking that comes out of SETI is is a little bit anthropocentric and it's a little bit constrained because we're it's really targeted at a certain kind of uh signal a certain sort of expected kind of area in which these these uh signals are going to to perform and there's really no reason to think that and I'll explain a little bit later about that but so the Rio scale can't handle 
passive data, and I'll talk about passive data later. I'll, I'll we'll go through what I some um, constraints that I, I uh, or uh, some mechanisms of identifying and distinguishing certain kinds of signals. Um, it can't handle extraterrestrial life as opposed to extraterrestrial intelligence because it's necessarily looking for signals in the radio spectrum. And so once it does that, it's automatically constraining, you know, life to be the intelligent variety that presumably is capable of launching radio signals and spaceships or whatever it is they've got going on in there. So it, it necessarily misses out on a massive part of a potential of, you know, extraterrestrial life. And in virtue of that, it's also anthrocentric, as I mentioned before. It tends to assume the signals that something is going to broadcast is the kind of signal that we're going to be expected to uh, interpret because we happen to have ears and eyes of certain spectra and all these kinds of things. And it's going to be on those wavelengths, or, to use an improper term. Um, and that's not necessarily the case at all. So what i've tried to identify is some parameters and what we can say for certain is look there are there are two hierarchies of extraterrestrial life the first one is life there exists life elsewhere in the galaxy uh of some sort or other you know amoeba-esque or or super intelligent uh, and the second one is that looks like super intelligent um and and the former may not necessarily develop the kinds of um, emission spectra that the, the the second one will, for obvious reasons, you know. And the the Fermi paradox is is focused on this latter half, uh, but the reality of biological evidence, the biological thinking here is that life is very likely and. Um, intelligent life is a much later subordinate process to the early stuff and that a great deal of life might be in the early port I, in the paper i mentioned that the dinosaurs managed to live 200 million years and, and didn't build a single house um <laughs> or broadcast a single kind of signal and they've been here orders of magnitude longer than we have so uh you know it's, it's interesting that the this broad length of life can exist without actually amassing any kind of technological or intelligent kind of capacity. Uh, and the Fermi paradox, which identifies that life in virtue of its long, in the universe in virtue of its extremely long time must have spat out some life somewhere, but it's not necessarily the case that that life must be intelligent. And the Fermi paradox does consider that, but it, it, I don't know that it's weighted sufficiently, but anyway, so that begets the question, well, what constitutes intelligence? And that's also an extremely good question. Um, SETI's definition, which is a sort of a capacity for radio, it's not really a definition, but it's kind of this benchmark by which they set their sort of um, target. And that that doesn't relate at all to like a, 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 a biological or some entity's capacity for intelligence. It just means that they aren't, they aren't necessarily intelligent in, in that they're broadcasting in ways that we expect them to. I mean, they might have some completely other mechanisms of, of communication or broadcasting or whatever that's just not, I mean, they might be coding quantum signatures for all we know because they're that far advanced, we, we don't know. But Seth's search for this radio, and, and I know that Seth Shostock has identified uh, that Seth is just, it's not just about that. It's, I'm being unfair to Seth by, by labeling them as, as, you know, only searching for, for radio signals. That's not fair. But, but broadly speaking, you can see this anthropocentrism, anthropocentrism. Yeah. Um, so uh, this, this, search this kind of parameter guidance that they're using is making these anthropocentric assumptions, which is that Etty would necessarily use uh, radio or, or signals at some sort of frequency that, that we do. And, and there's, there's just reasons for that because there's, there's a reason that life on earth has developed biologically to be able to see in certain spectra and hear in certain spectra and, and communicate in the way that we do. Um, 
vocalize and all these sorts of things. So there's there's, there's good reasons to <laughs> there's good reasons to think that that might be the case for Etty, but it's necessarily it's an assumption, and I I think it might be too constrained. I think it's unreasonable to expect that there aren't broader kinds of communication mechanisms, and that we ought to be looking at you know what kinds of communication mechanisms that might look like you know what's feasible what's reasonable um i define intelligence as the sort of level of cognition at which uh reasoned and abstract thought uh, occurs because that more recognizes intelligence than i can i can transmit on the frequency that somebody else is expecting to hear so I, I like I, I don't like using it. I prefer the term rational um, because I think rational sort of has a, a greater it's got a greater capacity to sort of reflect uh, an Etty's ability to make processed and ordered thought in ways that necessarily would lead to something like an ability to to as we would put it garner a capacity for technology um rationality is related to that not necessarily the capacity for radio um now baines and uh, schultz makuch claim that complex life is is likely uh in the world uh in the universe um and and what they what they say is that this this star trek fallacy of life this kind of humanoid creature you see in the background uh is 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 unlikely, uh, but possible because, as they put it, or as somebody else puts it, the the sort of the build schemata is it's it's in the records, you know. It's sort of uh, it, it's kind of possible, and therefore it's possible elsewhere. Uh, but in reality, life is most likely going to be extraordinarily different, and the reason for that is because the environmental pressures that have caused the human species to be in the way to be the way that it is is necessarily a function of of this planet and considering that other planets are are somewhat like this but not actually like this then the the environmental pressures the planetary limiting factors that constrain the development of life on another planet um are going to be massively different the the earth like planets that we're looking for we're looking for them because we believe that they they present a, the the right kind of environment for creatures like us to come about but there's no justification to think that that's the only way that life comes about there's just as much potential for silicon based life on an extremely hot and not earth like planet as there is for us to come about these kinds of biological bashing about of amino acids that form the primordial soup of evolution can occur in many different um, instances and, and, and mechanisms. It's just that we're only familiar with one because we only have one test sample. Um, and, and so uh, it's, I believe, mathematically more likely that the biological diversity of interplanetary life, which is an extraordinary sentence to say, um, is massively different, like like very different to what we are, sort of along the lines of the Tin Man kind of Star Trek entity or the crystalline entity, you know, these sorts of very unusual mind-stretching kind of entities are, are more likely, I would say, than, than this. Um, well, the other thing that we can sort of discuss related is that... Uh, how are we uh, able to know whether something is, you know, extraterrestrial life or extraterrestrial intelligence? Uh, and this relates to this stuff I was talking about with Seth. Um, they're kind of expecting extraterrestrial intelligence to be this sort of a thing. Reality says that it's more likely to be a, a very different sort of a thing. And it's quite difficult to determine what that sort of thing might be like you know when you when you try to stretch your mind and say well you know in in what way could we recognize a crystalline entity if we if we knew it and if you've watched the star trek movie it's it's all about harmonics and resonant frequencies and these kinds of things uh, well we have no ability to determine that kind of stuff 
um, because we're not looking for it. So we haven't built the technology in order to do that. So the the answer is that we may not, you know, there might be a, a, a significant number of probes having been whooshed through our solar system without us having any concept whatsoever that they are what they are. Um, and so that begs the question, and I use the term loosely, uh, how do we go about sort of sensing for for stuff, extraterrestrial artifacts or extraterrestrial life? And the tools that we have available are are remote sensing tools, basically, and they're kind of they're kind of this is a an example of the emission spectra that the that the Earth um, uh, sort of emits. And it's identifiable uh, distinctly because it has life on it. And so the emission spectra that, that we generate are different than, than what would occur from a natural planet. So we can infer the existence of, of uh, extraterrestrial life or extraterrestrial intelligence only at the moment from remote sensing. And the reason for that is because we're not there. So we can't go and sort of hunt the extraterrestrial chaps down because um, we haven't yet got that far. And, and remote sensing has ballooned in its capacities. I have a colleague that works at the University of Lethbridge just down the road, and he is his he works with NASA on scary remote sensing stuff that's just out of this world. Actually, of this world, but you know what I'm saying. Um, and the technology they have is remarkable, but it's all pointed in the wrong direction. We've, we're very busy trying to remote sense things about our planet because it's relevant and important to us and we've not really adapted that technology uh, to to be pointed at these um these uh the other planets the you know these these um uh potentially life hosting planets exoplanets uh and there's a reason for that is the technology is not that we're only just figuring out how to identify whether they exist and how, how they exist and how many there are uh, before we've even started to, to talk about, you know, what kind of um, spectra there are. We're getting there, but it's a process. Um, and so the reality is that it's the gases, you know, the emission spectra, the gases and the localized temperature light fluctuations and and variations of additive transfer and stuff. These are the mechanisms by which we'll actually identify um, uh, life, potential life. And constructedness itself may not be obvious. So... I hinted earlier on that there might have been many probes that have whooshed through our solar system, and we have no idea. I, I did have a slide, and I wish I'd thrown it in here, but there was an object that came into the solar system in 2018, and it, and it sort of whooshed in and whooshed out, as they do, um, traveling at Mach million. Um, and uh, we have no comprehension of whether that was a probe or not. It's just a big lump of rock, we thought, but but a big lump of rock that might have contained therein a number of recording sensing devices that we have no mechanism of identifying. And, and unless you land on it and drill about or whatever it is that you'd need to do, you'd never know. It's just a big rock, you know, and, and, and uh, constructedness of, of, I mean, even on, even on this planet, like the constructedness of an iPad is only, really obvious because we know what it does but if it if it's dead if it's flat the battery is flat and you look at it it's just a, it's just a lump of stuff and you have no comprehension of its capacity or its ability to do a thing and and even worse like computer circuits like the the microchips extremely complex entities inside but they just look like a bit of black a bit of black stone you know i mean you, it could have easily washed up on a on a beach somewhere and you'd never, you pick it up and you go, oh, that's interesting, but you'd never know because the complexity is within, you know? So we're, we're already con constructing and building stuff, which from the outside is not in the slightest bit um, clear that it's a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a made thing. So uh, it's feasibly possible that some extraterrestrial intelligence is firing massive amounts of stuff at us, uh, and we have no comprehension that it's uh, that it's a thing. So uh, it's it's likely then in our current state of technological advancement that spaceborne artifacts are only going to be known because they they move erratically. <laughs> and if you're trying to avoid, if you're trying to. 
be part of this prime directive thing uh, as a as an extraterrestrial intelligence and and not make your existence known to primitive life forms like Earthlings, um, then you're not going to make something move erratically. You're going to fire it off in a certain direction, use the sun to whip it about, and then collect it on the end as would appear most sort of objects entering the solar system. So it's only perhaps by erratic movement or that object's non-natural emissions that we would ever say, oh, hang about, that's that's a that's a constructed thing, you know? That's a Voyager-like aspect. I mean, Voyager has a constructedness because it's all spiky and it looks a bit odd, but but a bunch of sensors hidden in a rock flown through a, through a solar system is not. And so this sort of suggests then how, uh, what positions, in what sort of areas can we identify discovery? Uh, and this hasn't really been, I mean, it's been implicitly thought about, but not really explicitly thought about. Well, the first the first one is obviously extrasolar stuff. I call that distal because it's a long way away. So we could have distal discovery, and we could do that through remote sensing. So we, we poke one of our um, remote sensing devices at uh, our recently found exoplanet and, and lo and behold it comes back with some unusual spectrum we're like well you know that's clearly um life related so that there, there we have an extra solar system detection of of life um we can have an intrasolar system uh, detection of life so we might get a, a probe to europa drill down collect a sample of water and there are microbes buzzing about in it as there as as it is potentially possible uh, given its internal heat and its and liquid water and all that kind of stuff. So that's possible. We'll call that proximal. And then we have the in-Earth orbit kind of detection, uh, which, of course, is significantly more scary in light of it being sort of right there. You know, I mean, we can handle... Humans, I believe, would be able to handle the, the, the discovery of life on a, on a planet 20 light years away quite comfortable because the scientists will say, well, it'll take 20 light years to get anything from there to here at light speed, and that's not practical. So um, it'll take way many more years to get anything from there here in, in, in the real world. Um, but if something suddenly zooms into our atmosphere and uh, or into our orbit and then, <laughs> hi, uh, that's a significantly... I, I call it scary. It's not scary, but I, I believe that Earth will... Um, likely not respond well to that situation in virtue of the Hobbesian trap and other stuff, which we'll go on to talk about later. So I talk about those three possible locations, and they're, they're important because, uh, as certainly number three is important because it implies an intentionality. It also implies that whatever has, has zipped into our orbit has done so out of choice and directionality. You know, it's been directed here. We have piqued the interest of some other intelligent life, and now they're here to discuss stuff with us. And therefore, it, had, it, it also implies uh, advanced technology, not only because it's capable of getting here from somewhere else, and we're not at that stage yet, but it also implies that they've been able to identify somehow before they got here that we're here already. So there's a whole bunch of implied stuff that goes on that I, you know, is, is sort of wrapped up in the, in the existence of something here. My interest in this is largely related to something appearing in orbit. And so the, the distal discovery is less relevant to me because it's less imminent and, and it requires less. Uh, there's much more gear up time. You know, we've got plenty of time to think about stuff. But the funny thing about extraterrestrial intelligence is that it might be the case that Earth has to achieve some level of technological advancement before we become interesting to other anthropologically interested entities. And so I, given that we have reached a certain level of technological impasse, and who knows what that level might be, but now might be as good a time as any other to suddenly appear here and say, you're interesting, you've, you've garnered, you know, quantum technology, now we need to have a big talk about not 
blowing the universe up or something. I don't know, you know, whatever, whatever it is that motivates uh, Etty. And so uh, this is important to me because um, it's that kind of sudden arrival that's going to be the problem, not the kind of arrival, not the kind of discovery that we're going to find on the planet. Um, and the, the advanced technologies really uh, imply a great deal of technological development. So that, that, that Etty is capable of, and this is relevant to the Hobbesian trap. So I'm not bringing this up because it's just a weird science fiction thing that I'm going on, but the capacity to appear in orbit uh, with directed travel uh, means that Etty have a capacity for power demand and, and, and production that we don't have, uh, that they're capable of resolving uh, difficulties regarding long distance travel issues that we have no comprehension of. I mean, if, like I mentioned briefly earlier on, moving from one planet to another uh, is an extremely long process and, and there needs to be mechanisms to, to resolve that. And of course, shielding. So, um, because if you travel very fast, you only have to hit a small speck of something and it blows a big hole in the, uh, in the, in the uh, ship. So, uh, that breeds these three types of discovery, uh, which are related to what I mentioned earlier, non-natural emission detection, which I call passive, non-natural signal detection, which is a kind of an active thing because they're broadcasting or at least they're releasing a signal in a way that uh, is an active process for them. Uh, and then, of course, there's this, um, there's the in, in Earth orbit stuff or in solar system stuff, which is likely to be passive and possibly active. So the whole paper is structured about uh, a, a matter of communication. There was a, an article written that appeared in Acta Astronautica by Kareem Jabari et al. And they had suggested that uh, human species would be thrown into what they call a Hobbesian trap or what is known as a Hobbesian trap, Schelling's dilemma. Um, because uh, communication with, with extraterrestrial intelligence is not possible. And they get this idea from what they call the dominant philosophical thinking, and, and the dominant aspects are, are these two here. This is Quine. Um, and he wrote a, uh, he had this concept um, called radical translation, which was, uh, in which he suggested that if you had this unfamiliar utterance, you know, this, this word gavagai, uh then to try and determine what that meant uh it wouldn't be possibly argued without any kind of social context you would need to be part of that community in order to figure out absolutely what that word meant and and it's the absolute part that's relevant so he says that you can make a bunch of assumptions about the word you can you know every time a rabbit pops along you can say gabba guy and 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 you're like oh well, maybe that means a rabbit but there's then some talk about well what does it mean a rabbit part or a rabbit's foot or a rabbit's ears or bounce or like you know you need these are only assumptions and you you make those assumptions based upon our anthropocentric sort of uh perception of what might be meant in the way that we believe language is constructed um and we can reject that gabba guy means rabbit if you if you if the guy or entity points at, I don't know, a tree and says Gabba guy, now you're, you know, very confused because um, the, the conception of rabbit uh, no longer fits. And, uh, and so you can reject that kind of that definition. And so what happens, he says, is that you make these random assumptions about a word and then you can only disprove that assumption given some justifiable reason to, to, um, to discard it. And now Wittgenstein had a similar sort of uh, thing. He had this, what he calls a lion objection to understanding. And he said, look, if a lion could speak, we wouldn't be able to understand him because humans don't share any social context with the lion. Facial expressions to us are relevant and, and we can learn a lot about them. I, I use this in some other of my, uh, in more of my research on the picture theory of disability, but facial expressions are massively relevant in communication for human, and, and they must be viewed within a system of signs, he says, you know, this kind of, this, this kind of holistic sort of mechanism by which we identify one thing from another, you know, if you, if you look 
you know, if you have a certain expression when you see ga- a gather guy, you know, that that might help you to b- believe that a rabbit is cute. But if you're like, that's a gather guy, that might give you a completely different sort of interpretation. He says this is relevant. You know, this context is massively important um, because meaning is determined with, with relation to those signs. You know, that's the, the, the meaning of this of the sign itself and the meaning of the, the utterance and the, the, the phrase is, is relevant to, to the signs in which that it is part. And if you take, you know, if you take the context out of that, if you, if, if you, a lion has no shared context with humans. So he argues that he wouldn't be able to understand because the world for us is very different than, than it is for him. Um, now, Bernard Rowling and John Churchill, to to some degree, they say that that's not the case because with uh, with mammals, there's no complete incommensurability. We we uh, we do communicate uh, to some extent ex- extent with dogs and cats and horses, dolphins, lions, um, gorillas, and you know, we, porpoises. You name it, we we do communicate. Um, and some mammals have a capacity, a much deeper understanding is possible so for instance with coco gorilla the gorilla there was i'm led to believe uh coco spoke a thousand sign languages or sign signs um in sign language uh, I, that may or may not be the case uh, depending upon whichever author you happen to read but let's assume it is um then a much deeper mechanism of communication was was understood there and if you watch Coco communicate with Robin Williams and other people like that. There's definitely, I mean, regardless of whether the the gorilla actually did understand uh, sign language or what understand means in that term, he was certainly, or she was certainly, it was certainly capable of of communicating intention when he wanted Robin to play with him and tickle him. Uh, that's you know he 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 gave symbols and signs that were understood by by Robin Williams and his, his, his owners or carers. Um, so deeper understanding is meant, but that really then sort of asks us to, to determine what the word understand means. And, and that philosophically is, is complicated because it's not clear uh, from one thinker to another. Uh, Quine thought that understanding was a very fundamental uh, event. He thought it was a... a it was a very delineated, clearly defined, extremely robust sort of comprehension uh, that only humans and and some other animals can have. It was, you know, it's like a level of consciousness that 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 my dog, perhaps for Quine, wouldn't have. Um, Searle, John Searle, uh, uh, from uh, North American philosopher, he had this idea of a Chinese room and he said well look if I if I put a, a room and you feed some symbols into the room and then out of a, another window comes a translation in English he said uh, you know you don't really know whether the the thing inside the room if it's a person actually uh, understands Chinese and is translating it or whether they're they get the bunch of symbols and they get, open a you know, some sort of a dictionary, a translation book or whatever, and translate the symbols and 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 they say, yeah, this is this symbol is for this word and this symbol is for this word. And then they construct it and they apply a bunch of rules of grammar and then they spit out at the other end um, you know, the, the translation. But there's no understanding going on. There's a bunch of translation going on, which is not the same as understanding. And he believed that understanding was a much more internal process. And and so so a computer or some other thing doesn't doesn't understand um and and to a broader extent might not even communicate uh and so the question then becomes well when i ask siri to do me a thing does siri do the thing like like does it understand what i does it does it understand what i'm asking or does it just do what i, I want it to do and my whole point here is that it doesn't really matter whether there's a whole bunch of understanding going on when we're talking about first contact, all we care about is is that the outcome uh, is satisfactory or what we want. Uh, so if I ask Siri to um, 
wake me up at 10 30 in the morning i i don't really care whether they, she understands that i have an appointment going on or that being woken up is the process of i don't know coming from unconsciousness or however you want to describe it i, I just care that she you know at 10 30 she wakes me up and what i think is important and what i think uh kareem jabari uh, et al miss is that um we don't care whether an extraterrestrial intelligence understands what we mean by peace. We just really don't want it to kill us. We can work on the peace thing later uh, and how that means, you know, after we've stopped it destroying the planet or or <laughs> performing experiments or whatever it is that extraterrestrial intelligences are expected to do. Um, and so this is this is the this is the crux of the matter. Uh, why does it matter? Well, because from a functionalist perspective, which and I, I'm a functionalist, so I I don't I don't really care about whether or not there's a whole heap of understanding going on. I, I you know I'm I'm not I'm not a philosopher of the mind, so I don't I don't really care that much about whether there's a, a deeper sense of understanding or or consciousness going on. I just care that when I ask something, it, uh, it responds in a way that I want it to. You know, if I if I tell my partner I'm upset, I want her to be able to hug me uh, and, and comfort me. And I don't care whether there's a deeper understanding on there. I kind of just care about the hug. And I, I think for broader perspectives, I, I'm working on some stuff at the moment with artificial intelligence and virtual companions and there's some argument that says you know people are moving towards virtual companions to resolve their loneliness issues and the reality is that they don't actually care whether the virtual companion really cares or loves about them they just want to feel like the the, the virtual companion cares and loves about them and it's the feeling that counts and so whether or not the virtual companion understands the deeper concepts of love and relationships and all of these other sorts of stuff is, is less relevant to them than whether they feel loved and get a text halfway through the day that says how are you doing you know and so having not said uh having backed away from the functionalist perspective communication not understanding is important i believe because as i've said the understanding can come later don't harm us is more important because before we start having the conversation about peace and quantum coding and power production and shielding and faster than light travel or whatever other technological nonsense we hope to seek from the first contact, we really need to start talking about uh, how we can explain our fragility to it and how our how our society is delicate and, and easy to harm. And we would prefer that it didn't do that in part of its desire to know more about us. In which case, we we can make the assumptions that Quine says that we, we need to in order to, to sort of locate language without having to bother about the understanding part. We, we just need to be relatively sure that the assumption is a good one and not the kind of assumption that military idiots, uh, and I can say that having, having been part of that fraternity for a while, uh, that these these people that are in charge of our military capacities um, make these very rapid, you know, sort of uh, decisions that go instantly to defensive strategies or offensive strategies. Um, and what we actually just want to know is, is, is how can we have a discussion without it leading to this necessary or, or what is viewed as a necessary kind of military result? assumptions are used all the time we use them in the scientific method you know in, in order to come up with a hypothesis a hypothesis is an assumption and we use the scientific method to disprove that and it's used in logic here you see a, a, a small logic proof but um uh, the assumption is made on line one that uh, if q then r and 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 then if not q then not p and and so on and so forth and, and so long as we cash these assumptions out logic is not classical logic in itself does not instantly explode and we end up with a whole bunch of drama as long as you take the assumption form it properly make it reliable and dependable and then cash it out properly there's no problem in using assumptions at all so quine's worries 
which are more directed at, at actually knowing language and understanding itself. I get that. But uh, th they can't influence our Hobbesian thinking here or our thinking about first contact here because it doesn't apply in the way that Kareem Jabari, I think it does. So I argue that what we care about is this sort of communication at the level of what I call performative function, which is, I, you know, I'm going to I'm going to ask you to do a thing or we're going to try and communicate a thing. And it should have the desired outcome, which is don't kill us or, you know, please don't hurt us or we're friendly or, you know, I mean, couch whatever you want in there, you know, whatever pr primitive primordial kind of concept it is that you need the the extraterrestrial intelligence to understand that's it you just need them to 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 act such that it it represents those wishes that we have they don't need to understand what it means to be peaceful they don't need to understand what harm means they just need to understand that if they do this this is not a thing that we want them to do or if we want them to do a thing this is the thing that we want them to do uh, and that is not the same thing. You know, a deeper level of understanding of comprehension could come later. Uh, performative function is not necessarily anthropocentric. You can, like my dog is, I know there's 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 a Earth-centric kind of cross-species similarity here, but my dog, Jip, is, you know, I can get him to do a whole bunch of things, and he does it religiously it's not like it's you know and, and whether it's a conditioning or not is irrelevant because it still it still obtains the desired outcome and at the early stages of communication that's all we care about so this common human context doesn't need to be a system of reference you know quoting uh quoting quine this common human context doesn't need to be that system of reference it just needs to be there just needs to be some system of reference by which the eti are capable of inferring or assuming our re relatively reliably our intentions or wishes um and so we can look at shared mammalian i mean they may not be mammalian of course but uh, they, they are uh, they're likely to be a, a biological entity and so eating or or at least energy consumption of some sort or other must be must be a system for them fear must be a system for them because they have to be able to understand predation and all these kinds of things that have helped them along their evolutionary scale they have the protection reproduction you know no whatever you want to call it or uh, shared universe context you know these broader things we share the same universe we share the same rules of logic the laws of physics you know uh, electromagnetic spectrum mathematics and of course this br brings us to communication at levels of not necessarily um uh, explicit data like peace or harm or hurt or friends or anything like that but just the recognition and repetition of signals something that's importantly relevant by which we can start the communication some mechanism of getting etty to recognize the pattern in something this mathematical uh um, process by which we identify in in the film um, uh, they use quavers and musical notes to start a communication which builds a pattern and then fancy computers recognize patterns and and build the language and so on and so forth and 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 this is just the process by which we problem solve so we're pattern recognizers uh because pattern recognition is important uh, to humans as a process of of deconstructing and recognizing things and pattern recognition uh is likely something that all eti will use because it's probably um, that mechanism by which they interpret. Now, pattern recognition can be mathematical, but it can also be uh, uh, tonal or, or, you know, so on and so forth. So um, that brings us uh, to the Hobbesian trap. So how, how does that relate? Well, Thomas Hobbes was this uh, bit of a kooky character that lived forever. Um, actually, he died just around the corner from where I used to live in England uh, and uh, had a very interesting sort of life. It's a bit of an odd character. Um, and he he said that in a state of nature, when when there are, when there exists no law, no law keeper, uh, we, we we sort of we we desire things um as entities 
And if we can't share them, we start to fight over them. And uh, so he says that if if any two men desire the same thing, which nevertheless they cannot both enjoy, uh, they become enemies and and endeavor to destroy or subdue one another. Now, name your desire thing, you, you know, like um, partner access, female access, male access, land, food, water, cars, name your thing, you know. Uh, in a state of nature, he says, you know, we're, we're, we desire this thing. We can't both share this thing, so I'll fight you for this thing, and then I'll take the thing. Um, and so we live in com- constant diffidence, he, he calls it, which is a sort of a, a kind of a existent state of your fear of my fear of your fear of my fear, this uncertainty, this trepidatious kind of fear. Um, and because we're all broadly equal to another, you, you might be stronger than I am, I might be cleverer than you, and, and so I might defeat your your rock-like um, wrestling manoeuvres with some artefact that I might have created. Uh, and so because of this equality, um, this broad equality, uh, we, are, we are frightened of each other, knowing that uh, some people can use their intelligence against, uh, against a, a physical... Uh, strength increases and that kind of stuff. And so that we, we're actually all, or I might team up with other people and fight you because whatever. So he says that we're all equal to each other and uh, we're all equally able to destroy each other for this thing that we can't share. This is relevant because one of the the concepts uh, that it floats around all the time, why extraterrestrial intelligence would be interested in Earth is for for the resources. I actually think that's an extremely naive, <laughs> anthropocentric sort of position <laughs> that a species capable of traveling across the universe or across the galaxy would be interested in this tiny little planet um, full of irritating humans because we have more what? We, more diamonds or more like what? Like what? What is it that we have more of that they couldn't get from some other planet? Nothing. But anyway. And so this leads us to this kind of uh, this belief that within the galaxy, if we travel through the galaxy, or if some Ethi travels through the galaxy, uh, there must exist a state of nature because there's no there's no there's no federation of planets to protect us from each other. There's no there's no big federation of planets that stops the Borg or the whatever it is from killing you. You know, you're on your own, and in that existence without that law keeper there's no one to protect us from each other and and as we fight on earth it is hypothesized that we fight in space because we desire these resources like typically capitalist kind of thinking near <laughs> that the universe should be all about this self-reliability and all this sort of stuff but anyway um and in a first contact situation, we are therefore forced into the Hobbesian trap. You know, we exist in the state of nature. Aliens are dangerous. They want our shit. We want their shit, um, he says. Uh, and we live in diffidence and seek the domination of others. And I don't mean others on the planet, but seek seek the domination of extraterrestrials because I guess we live in fear of them. Once you've dominated an extraterrestrial or dominated somebody else on the planet, they live in fear of you and you hold the dominant sort of position and you, and you don't have that diffidence because you're in this sort of position of power and and um, uh, and and therefore and this is how Hobbes gets to governments, you know, we and sovereigns we 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 yield to sovereigns uh, because they promise to protect us from other sovereigns who want our stuff. Um, and uh, and so, you know, Hobbes in this case would say we'll either yield to the extraterrestrial intelligence, uh, hoping that they will protect us from the Borg, um, or um, we will fight the the extraterrestrial intelligence, hoping to um, subsume them and 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 conquer them, and and they will. Um, was uh and yes it's a hobbesian trap and here we are we're sat in it but in a game theoretical analysis this which is the process i'm sure you're familiar and i'm sure the listeners are familiar but game theory is this uh process by which um uh rational kinds of uh thought and rational uh, decision making can be done by using mathematical kinds of um 
calculations to help us behave in a way that would would win in particular games uh, which describe particular activities in life. And uh, one of the problems in the Hobbesian trap is that it leads us to make these risk dominant rather than payoff dominant strategies. And this is just because of the way that the, the matrix, the mathematical matrix that describes the interaction actually actually has the, the, the payouts. And we've been in, in this Hobbesian trap, like it sounds like a philosophical, ideological sort of thing cooked up by this weird 17th, 18th century guy. Uh, and it kind of is, but, but the Cold War can be described in terms of um, uh, in terms of game theoretically, as as most interactions can, uh, and in particular, um, the Cold War, uh, the USSR and uh, the US seek to have this advantage, this sort of military advantage or, and, and strategic advantage over each other, and and in order to do that, they both want to make the first strike because the first person to make the first strike like I mentioned in the galactic sort of thing, is that is that we then have this position of hierarchy and from here we're protected because we're dominant and, and they receive damage and, and, and we end up in a much more uh, uh, safer position. Um, so it's basically a big game of chicken. Uh, and chicken is the, the term, or hog dove is the term that's used to describe the matrix and the, and the relevant payouts and all these kinds of things. Hawk Dove is, is particularly used for uh, to describe those circumstances where there's a, a cost of achieving a certain kind of resource, which is relevant here, and this is why it's a, a sort of a Hawk Dove or chicken game. Now, Hawk Dove is not zero sum, and it destroys value when it when it's played. So, uh, if you think about two cars playing the traditional game of chicken, you know, if one car swerves, uh, then the ego is damaged. But if they both hit then the cars are damaged and the people are damaged and and so it destroys value but it doesn't always destroy value equally to the amount of of thing that's won so if if a, one individual swerves and the other individual doesn't swerve then you know buddy gets the kudos and the chick at the ice cream bar and the other guy gets the you know the jeers of misappropriate you know uh jeers and sneers um and in terms of assets, uh, you know, it, the first strike achieves um, significant damage at the cost of one missile, uh, and they elevate by the military might and, and potentially, you know, um, domination of the other country. Uh, and so this describes us uh, and the Cold War game. This is the this is the the matrix that I mentioned earlier that describes the Cold War game. And it's going to be a little difficult for me to point out on the screen, but uh, in the in the first no-strike um, uh, box, you can see that bilateral peace results in random figure of two points aside. Uh, but bilateral war uh, results in, in nothing because it's just misery uh, for everybody. In fact, you could probably make those negative figures somewhere along the line, uh, negative a half or something. You can play about with these figures. And, and what's important is this follows, uh, roughly speaking, Jab Jabari et al's sort of um, uh, uh, figures of payouts, these numbers being the payouts. And uh, you can see when the first strike is made, if the, if the first strike is made by the US, obviously the US win one point and, and and the USSR lose one point. And so peace becomes the, the payoff dominant strategy. Um, but both players are better with, with, because both players are better with plus two than minus one or zero. Um, but this strategy adopting the, the, you know, the no, no first strike policy only plays off uh, if you can guarantee that your other player plays the same strategy. So, you know, deciding not to fight each other is the best option, but it only works if you can be absolutely sure that your opponent is not going to fight you. And if they are going to fight you, then you're into this situation where if you don't strike or you don't strike back, now you're going to be in a much more, a much worse position because you're ending up with minus one instead of zero. So, so the risk dominant strategy there is, is understood in game theoretical concepts as the, as the safer play. If you make the strike, you get the plus one, uh, and zero for more is better than minus one. So it's just it's just safer to be aggressive. 
And so the rationality goes. Uh, in a risk-dominant game, the more unsure you are about how the other party is going to act, then the, 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 the more likely and safer you are to risk the risk-dominant strategy. Well, the problem with this, uh, Jabin, Karim Jabara et al. tell us, is that the leading philosophies in, in the leading theories in philosophy, uh, those of Quine and Wittgenstein and others, say that communication is impossible because understanding is impossible. There's no shared context. And so if we receive signals, and Karim uh, Jabaria do talk specifically about distal uh, first contact, which is, is different than proximal, but also not dis different. Uh, so signals received from another planet are, are likely to be unclear. I think that's, that's fair. Uh, there's no meaningful communication possible because we don't have any shared context. And that will result in fear, and that will force us to adopt these risk-dominant strategies, and thus we end with um, uh, mutual assured destruction, uh, which is the outcome that we, we were heading to in the, the Cold War and, and, uh, and the prisoner's dilemma that describes the Cuban Missile Crisis nearly got us there as well, and we just end up in a big ball of mess. And this is the problem, so, so they say, uh, resulting from extraterrestrial intelligence. So it's better, they argue, that we shouldn't court these kinds of signal transmissions and, and so on and so forth, because if we get into this conversation, this is going to happen. It's all going to be a horrible mess. Um, but we can sort of, we can sort of, you know, they make, a, they make a number of assumptions throughout the paper, which we can sort of dismiss. They assume that game theoretical rationality is, is best. Um, and and that's not clear. In fact, the reality is that in, in many iterative games, it is far better to adopt a non-game theoretical uh, disposition because the outcome is, is always better. Uh, and so human decision-making, they say, uh, or, or I say, uh, uh, considers, you know, other things like ethics and emotion and experience. And we realize that if we act aggressively, we tend to receive aggressive, you know, there's this mirroring thing. If you act aggressively, the other person acts aggressively, and then we're all aggressive. Um, and so we, we do this mirroring thing. We're aware of ethics. You know, we make decisions. It's not ethically right to tell your child that this medicine that you're going to tell them, you know, you stick it in, you go, mm -hmm, yeah, that's really good. And then you force this medicine down the throat and it tastes terrible. But you lie to them because it's good for them. You know, it's what they need. And this alters the way that we perceive decision-making. And there's no reason to suppose that extraterrestrial intelligence are any different. They've probably gone through the same sociological constraints to form, uh, you know, social bonds. Uh, they, they must have adopted these processes to be socially cohesive and, uh, and, and survive. Um, and, and being sustainable requires that you don't dump all of your resources into making weapons. You have to come up with some other mechanism because otherwise you end up in a big unsustainable mess. And, and Sagan actually argues that aggressive intergalactic imperialism is, is unstable in virtue of, of it being too resource hungry. Uh, and that those, those civilizations that have reached the required duration of intelligence um, are too old to have fought each other in, in, uh, to the death, you know, because it's, that's a, that's a non-sustainable sort of situation. The second way we can sort of dismiss their claims is that um, they argue that even, you know, even were ready to employ game theoretical rationality, then they, then they must choose the risk dominant strategy, but that's, that assumes that risk dominant strategies are safer. Uh, and what that means is that they're mathematically more dependable to result in a certain kind of outcome. Um, but in reality, of course, that's, that's not the case uh, because humans, albeit we are rational, um, we don't always choose the safer risk dominant strategies. In fact, in iterative games of Prince of Dilemma, we, we don't. Um, and in games of chicken, we have this weird social mechanism that sort of deals with that for us because we are aware of the 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 loss and costs and all these other sorts of things so we, we d just don't act like that despite it being rational to do so uh and they assume that that 
extraterrestrial intelligence would also make the the these risk dominant plays. But of course, if they're like us in the real world, they actually won't. I mean, they probably understand the mathematical connections behind this, but they they don't act that way. So, um, and we can prove that because Viminit shows that rational, uh, you know, rational strategies when run recursively don't work well. And and Axelrod has showed that in end step PD games, greedy strategies are worse than 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 ones that are altruistic and, and so on and so forth. So, you know, and the third way of showing is that um, they claim that lack of shared human context makes communication impossible. But of course, we have demonstrated that we can have a performative level of communication with dogs and gorillas. If I ask my dog, Jip, to get me his plush moose, um, he, he, he does. Uh, I, I don't... I don't know whether there's a deeper level of moosity going on in his head. I don't, you know, I don't know whether he grasps that as being, you know, what what does it mean to fetch the moose? What does what is the moose? What what does mooses look like? What is the fetch thing? It just brings me the thing, and and that's what's important because initial communication, as I said, should target things like don't harm us because that's for us what's important. But we can also look at the the matrix uh and the way they've laid it out and and it can be shown to be false because we don't share the hobbesian equality principle now remember hobbes says that um i i live in fear of you because i know that we are equally matched should we come to fight over some some shared resource but the reality is that we don't share that um with etty and, and when we have a vastly different capabilities between factions, any kind of any kind of first strike is irrational because we're just going to get whooped. You know, so you, you might you might look at you know certain wars where uh, military campaigns have been won um, by smaller countries, but they've usually been done. Well, it's rarely been done, and and normally the most dominant the most dominant sort of uh, country is the one that has the, the greatest resources and the greatest military and the greatest military might and the greatest technology and so on and so forth. Uh, the, the real world examples of David and Goliath are, are fairly rare. Um, and so for any game, you know, we have to understand that Etty have technological superiority, which means that they're, um, uh, that the, the payouts are altered because the costs are altered and the, and the losses are altered. So in what we call the game of stars here, which is, which is the, my modification of, of uh, Jabaria et al's um, uh, matrix, this is what I would say would be a, a more realistic payout. So we see that bilateral war here is minus 10. And, and the reason for that is because uh, we lose the planet. Like if Etty come along in their fancy spaceship with all their super ray guns or whatever it is they've got going on, they'll just take the planet because we have no capacity to engage either in in proximal or distal warfare. We, we just it's not it's not an option. However, peace is a significantly higher uh, value because um, uh, we you know we get the benefit of shared communication, technological development, so on and so forth. Um, we lose if we make the first strike uh, we, we lose three instead of their losing half for the cost of the lasers or whatever they're going to blow us up with um because we, we've revealed that we can't we can't play on that game you know that's a bit like going to a, a war and somebody bringing out well, well we've got one at the moment haven't we i'll try not to make a political comment but um We've got one at the moment where the Ukraine is running around with with now Challenger tanks from the UK against the Russian, uh, the older Russian technology, and you know you've got got these massive difference in technology, and so we've revealed, as have the Russians, that they are not capable of uh, con contemporary warfare, and this would be blatantly obvious as we send our small nuclear missile up to a well defended laser beamed spaceship or whatever it is. Um, and so uh, we then end up with uh, a plus half, plus a half point because our missile has struck. But you can see from this image on the, on the left, um, this is a, a, a damaged aluminum plate in, this, in the space station, which was struck by a piece of plastic that the guy is holding 
um, at 40,000 miles an hour. Now, if the the if any extraterrestrial intelligence have flown from their planet to our planet, they've well exceeded 40,000 miles an hour. And there's a lot of space debris kicking about the universe. If they strike even the smallest speck of something at, at half the speed of light or a quarter of the speed of light, the amount of damage is unbelievable physically. And so they have to have shielding. And so, I, you know, people say, oh, you're shielding, you're talking about Star Trek stuff. No, I'm talking about actual, pragmatic, realistic, uh, necessary stuff that would, would that an ETI spacecraft would need to get from their place to our place without incinerating themselves. So they're well shielded. And so we, we, can't, we can't make these claims. So in the game of stars, the real game of stars, you can demonstrate because the equality principle of, of Obsian sort of um, uh, ideology is, is, is violated. Um, the, the, the payout strategy becomes dominant and the risk dominant strategy is, is no longer rational. Um, so assuming we might still be fearful of aliens, uh, Etty's sort of preferences, um, or intentions, and and we we don't have a very good level of communication. Uh, does that mean that we should stop actually sending signals and stop engaging in that kind of looking, you know, that SETI stuff? Is that is that actually what follows? Well, I don't think so. No, I think the way out of this problem is to re return to first principles. I'm a philosopher, so always go back to first principles. Uh, we'll start with axioms. We'll create a list of axioms. Uh, these are enabling assumptions which permit us to move forward in in ways that are uh, can create proper thought rigorous thought careful and safe thought that's not related to mathematical rationality which is demonstrated to be incoherent uh, sometimes and uh, not not rational in that it doesn't get us to where we want and that these axioms can limit conjecture so we we don't like guess we make well-informed decisions and create the building blocks of thought slowly uh, and carefully rather than just assuming a bunch of things that may or may not be true. Uh, and in virtue of that, axioms and the dependence on those reduces the potential for poor decision-making because we're, we're using facts, uh, dependable assumptions um, that we can create a framework with to develop what I call the first contact protocol, which is something we don't have, and I think is, is necessary. So this whole article, which you'll, uh, which uh, readers can find online, it, it's, it's, a, it's an open-ended thing. I'm not saying that I've got it all right. I'm not one of those philosophers that claims to solve the problems of the universe. I, it, this is a conversation, and I'm just saying we kind of need to we kind of need to work on this, and we're not working on this. So here's my attempt at a start. Please feel free to bash it about and add more stuff and take some stuff out and and let's let's begin this procedure in, in a way uh, that is beneficial to the. It's probably because I'm a practical philosopher that this is the way I work. Um, so I, this is an ongoing list, uh, and I've tentatively grouped uh, aspects of them into the metaphysical, the sociological, and 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 axioms of executive function. They don't need to be grouped. It's just that's sort of how they've come about. Um, and and I suppose we could start with the first one. But so the the, the first I've uh, I've sort of identified is the axiom of incarnation. Uh, th that's a sort of a limiting factor that says that you know, in order to think about Etty, they need to be the kind of Etty that are knowable um, and accessible. So they, they kind of need to be you know they can't be a cloud of electrons because I might fly through them or we'd know have no way of detecting them or I can't interact with them in a way that's meaningful. It's not that they don't exist. It's that they need to be of the kind in which we can have this communication. Um, then there's the axiom of recognition, which is related. And that says, you know, it, th this cloud of electrons needs to be identifiable. You know, we're talking about the, the crystalline entity of Star Trek, you know, I mean, it, it, like that, that needs to be identifiable. It needs to be a thing that I can look at and say, well, that's not natural. That must be that must be an, that, like an extraterrestrial intelligence of some description or extraterrestrial life. It's got to be recognizable as distinct from a rock, uh, for instance. 
uh, and and that has to do also with the 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 probes, you know, like ethi artifacts. For them to be relevant to us, we kind of have to identify that they're relevant to us. So that object that came into the solar system and disappeared off in 2018, um, we have no way of knowing whether that was an artifact or not because it wasn't identifiable. It didn't have like antennas on it, and it didn't have signals coming out of it, and, and so on. Uh, the next axiom of, is the axiom of executive capacity, and that just basically says that, look, an ETI needs to be, it must be the case that ETI are capable of reasoning, because, uh, and not just reasoning, but reasoning in, in what Kant would call uh, the hypothetical imperative, which is, um, you know, in order to do X, uh, I must do Y. Or if you run it backwards, I must do Y if I want to get X. This kind of this kind of logical sort of hypothetical reasoning is necessary because without it, uh, you can't have that goal directed thinking, and you can't you can't develop technology. Basically, you don't get off the ground. You know, you, uh, the, so it, it's it's likely that Ethi must have that. Certainly, Ethi and and almost totally Etl as well. Um, Ethel. Uh, and related to executive capacity, but but importantly distinct, is uh, the axiom of, of decision protocol, because um, that means that there has to be a mechanism within ETI to recognize that some of the decisions that are hypothetically possible ought not to be done because they are socially damaging or socially problematic or, or, or you know, they're... they're uh, uh, harmful to to an end their own individuals or the planet or something and and so this we can assume if you know if they're if they're if they have survived long enough to have remained um ethel then they have this and if they're uh in intelligent uh extraterrestrial then they absolutely have this um i i think i mean we could this is an open-ended list so we could have the conversation about whether these are good or not uh I've also added an axiom of creativity because there's something importantly distinct uh, about getting to a getting to a decision or, or, or a, 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 like a goal that is different than just thinking about it. So um, you have to understand, for instance, what a what a a tool does in order to create it. You know. In order to say, well, I, I need a thing to tighten these lug nuts, you have to A, have the lug nut, and then you have to B, understand that the lug nut needs tightening, and C, that the lug nut needs tightening in a way that it's not too tight, and you snap it off. So, like, there's a whole bunch of, and so these constrain the tool development uh, in important ways, but that there needs to be a creativity there. You can imagine a tool to do the job. Um, and so, while you can get to puzzle solving, you know, Iteratively, you can you can try a stick or a or a whatever or a chocolate wrench or something. You know, you can try all these different things. It, it's a very exhaustive process and it takes time. It's not very efficient. And so, any I believe that any uh, extraterrestrial intelligence that has the level of intelligence we're talking about must have this sort of creativity, because otherwise, they'd have there's no other process by which they can come about these ideas that is not exhaustive taxing on resources and now we have the axiom of evolution now this this is a, a bit tricky in the sense that i i was hesitant to throw this in here but basically what i'm trying to argue is that i don't understand how any extraterrestrial intelligence or life could come about other than a selective process constrained by nature and the the planetary aspects upon which the the eti develop it is possible to argue that for the the you know the creating kind of god related argument that that eti like us were created by a divine creator or a great creator um but i'm scientifically based and so without being disrespectful um Basically, what happens is if you accept creationism as a function of being brought about, you then end up uh, amplifying the 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 
entities result in, in this discussion. And so it sort of violates Occam's principle. And it's just, it, it's not that we can't get about the creation in the same way and, and say, you know, life has been created somewhere that's different from us because that's the way God wanted it to. But if we did that, we sort of stop any kind of serious development of discussion because we have we have no mechanism of determining things that are related to evolution. All bets are off, basically. You know, it's a bit like throwing the spanner in the red. You, know, you don't know what's going to come out of that. So that aside, there is no other mechanism I can think of. It's possible that, that uh, Etty is uh, artificial intelligence, but artificial intelligence needs a creator, which implies uh, a biological entity of some description or other, or else you're in a you're in a, a you know a circular loop uh, of, of creationism, and that just gets us nowhere. So, um, so that's where I got to. I've thrown it in because I can't recognize any other. I can't think of any other mechanism by which an ethy would have developed other than that. Um, the axiom of sociality is is broadly related to. Uh, evolution in that you can't have an, an etty um, constituting of a species of, of one. Um, I can't imagine how that would be. I can imagine how that might be the end state of an evolutionary process that some species sort of regenerates, but, but like along the evolutionary track somewhere, there must be a mechanism of, of splitting and dividing and recreating and, and getting rid of you don't have evolution if you don't have a process of death and and whatever. So, um, so that implies sociality, at least in the sense that their species has more than one member, and whether or not they're social, they have the comprehension of other entities that they have to regard in some way. Maybe not in the way that they invite them around for tea, but like you know, in in, in some mechanism, they have to regard. Uh, that there exists another entity. Uh, and that means that they also are individualized, <laughs> that they recognize themselves as distinct as something else, and, and that that brings about this sociality in the sense that they are other regarding in some way. Um, and because of that, they have a mechanism of deliberation. That means that there has to be some mechanism of resolving conflicts um, between individual species members. There has to be a mechanism by which they say, this is my territory, this is my food, this is my light source, this is my this is my bit, I need this, I, I need this to survive, uh, and to resolve those perhaps pseudo-territorial sort of aspects of, of existence, you know. And so they have to, I don't mean that they sit about and discuss how they're dividing up the planet in terms of maybe they do, but um, I'm not saying that that's necessarily the case. There just needs to be a mechanism by which they resolve these conflicts and inter, you know, needs and resources, resource distribution. The axiom of temporality is a bit of an odd one, uh, but I sort of came about thinking about it because of the Men in Black movie, oddly enough, the, the fourth dimensional creatures that could exist because they can perceive time running in different directions and just have a very different sort of aspect of time. Um, I, sure, I, I can imagine that sort of an entity exists, um, but such an entity or any entity needs to have, any etty needs to have the ability to distinguish cause from effect because uh, otherwise you don't get, uh, you, you don't get to be able to build kind of harm recognition. You have to understand that something causes harm or, you know, if you eat this thing, you sate this kind of need for energy or if you suck up some sunlight, you, 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 you sate the need for energy or whatever it is. So they have to, they have to have this process by which they recognize this thing from this thing. Uh, and, and what this means is that you have to be able to conceive time, you know, there's, or at least there is this process by which you conceive time, even if you don't sort of conceive it as, as a time, you have to recognize that, one thing happens before some other thing happens. So uh, there needs to be a period of time before the sun comes up or, or there needs to be a period of time in which you rest or there needs to be a period of time it takes to get you from one place to another place, like th just to be able to separate existence in those terms. Um, this is somewhat related to harm sensitivity because of course uh, it's possible that some creature exists all the time 
um, but it, all creatures that are evolved and are exposed to harm of some description or other, planetary harm, uh, other species harm, predation, whatever you, you want, you know, and this sort of implies that they have a concept of physical damage uh, and also that they have some sort of understanding of risk assessment. If you ever see a, a dog approach something or a cat approach something, it doesn't doesn't know about it, it does it very tentatively because it doesn't want it, because it recognizes harm, right? It understands what those processes are. It doesn't, you know, it, the cat will bat the thing and then flinch and run away because it recognizes that there's a the potential to be eaten by whatever soft, fluffy toy it's playing with. So uh, these are important aspects, and I think Ethi will have developed them because it's a part of being evolved. Uh, the axiom of agency number and, and Heikety, uh this means that they have to have a mechanism of, of interacting, agency of interacting with the world. They have to be able to touch things, move things, or physically uh, move stuff around in the world that enables it to locate food or, or uh, find um resources or, or build things you know if they're if they're an etty they need to be able to ma manipulate stuff in in in, in the real world <laughs> uh and so they they must have a means of, of doing that and then because that they must have a mechanism of distinguishing one thing from another thing so uh if they build a thing they they must be able to recognize one i don't know rivet from another rivet or one electrical wire from another electrical wire that, that there has to be this mechanism of distinguishing number you know the two plates four rivets you know whatever um and then heikety that this rivet is not the same as that rivet and 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 this wire is not the same as that wire it looks like the same wire but it's not the same wire. so they have to have these concepts or, or else you can't get to um uh, the process of individualing or building you can't be you can't build a thing or individuate a thing you can individuate from sociality because i am this thing and that's that thing and we're not the same thing so you you can get to that but you have to be able to identify in terms of eti uh, you have to be i think you have to be able to in, you know do, do that kind of thing so these um these kinds of uh, things are relevant in the in the constructedness of of becoming what we would consider an intelligent entity um i am repeating myself um the axiom of communication this goes back to what we've said before you know they, they are social and they have a decision protocol and so they must have a mechanism of 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 communicating even if that's a basal grunt to to say something like this is mine or go away or i'm horny but you know, like i don't i don't know whatever they've got going on they they need they need to have some mechanism to express that and it might not necessarily be verbal i'm not suggesting that you know it could be pheromonal or or like they could vibrate or they could manipulate magnetic i i don't you know this is i don't want to fall into the anthrocentrist sort of seti trap here i'm just trying to say that they they must have a mechanism of communicating with other things and eti in particular uh, must have a mechanism of communicating to coordinate things. So assuming an ETI can't build a spaceship on itself or build a transmitter on its own, it needs to be able to do so socially. You know, it needs to be able to say, well, here's the, here's the plan. Uh, this is how we build this. We need this sort of resource. We've got to smelt that thing down and build this. So there has to be some sort of communication going on there, and it doesn't necessarily need to be verbal. Um, and here we arrive at the axiom of the shared context. So... This is what I've mentioned before about sharing the same universe, and so we necessarily share the same laws of physics, so we do have those things, and because we have the axiom of evolution, we also have the same processes that bring us about as brought them about, so we can reasonably and practically assume that there are a number of constraints that have affected and influenced their existence, and from that we can derive a whole bunch of things that I haven't derived, that are useful because if we can assume that something is communicate if something is capable of communication then it follows that we're capable of communicating with it it just needs us to be able to recognize how they're communicating and adapt to that technique of communication it's not rocket science it just needs figuring out and and instead of adopting the quine postulate the quinean postulate no nope, not possible let's go home um it's much better to say yeah it's possible let's figure out how um and the last one that i came up with is 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 a bit complex 
hierarchy, pluralism, heterogeneity, and political society. I'm, <laughs> I suppose I'm, I suppose I'm capitalizing on my inner hobs here. I'm trying to bring about um, the existence of a political ethy, uh, and I and I've done this because an individualist culture, and what I mean by this is like a in an individualist culture. There has to be some structure or organization because even within bees, you know, even within very egalitarian things, there are bees that do this and bees that do that and a queen. Uh, and, and that's a hierarchy, right? That, that's, a, that's a group hierarchy. And it's also a pluralist group hierarchy. So there are multiple bees and one queen. And so within these cultures, uh, within a culture for an etty that is capable of building a thing, you can't build the thing on your own. So you need people to help you build the thing or other ethics to help you build the thing. And in order to do that, you have to be able to express like a, a group goal. And and you have to be able to say, well, you do this and you do that and you do the other. So now somebody's doing the deciding. Uh, and even if there isn't a deciding, there's some mechanism by which the jobs are divided so that not all, not one Etty is doing all the jobs and not all Etty's are doing the same job. So there's the, like there's got to be these kinds of, pluralism and, and so on and so forth. The heterogeneity, of course, is is like I'm just trying to say that they're not this they're not all, you know, they're not like there's a tiered governance system with multiple individuals that are different. And the tiered governance system brings about the political society. And this heterogeneity means that they're not all Borg like they don't all operate kind of I mean even Borgs have a sort of a like a they have a collective conscious, but they also have a queen which decides what they're going to do and where they're going to do it and that's what i mean by these you know I, it's a very basic prince it's a very basic concept of, of political society but it has to be it has to be a thing uh just because you can't i don't understand how you could get to a a, a structure of like a, a intellectual device a, a radar or a, or a signal or an antenna or a spaceship or, I don't, or a house or a home or any, I don't understand how you could do that without some sort of individuation and political sort of structure. Um, finally, wrapping up, the point of all of this is, well, I want these axioms to be used instead of uh, game theoretic rationality, because if we follow game theoretic rationality, we're, we're going to end up in the Hobbesian trap. We're going to end up becoming aggressive. We're going to end up uh, in a first contact situation without any preparedness, we're going to go and knee jerk reactions to dominance because for some reason or other, humans always think we're bigger and stronger and better than we are. And, and we will completely fail to grasp the magnitude of the situation as we've done so many times before. And we'll end up in a big mess. And so I want these actions to be used as a mechanism to prepare for first contact with facts, data that's reliable, dependable, not conjectural, not mathematically relevant, just, just useful. Uh, and to develop a protocol um, that will help us to, to resolve first contact situations. And, and I mean, I've just knocked a very quick thing up here. Like, first thing, ensure that neither us or them are harmed. Second thing, that we seek peaceful cooperation, that we seek to communicate uh, both that we don't want any harm and that we're peaceful, uh, to find out whether Ethi, you know, want the same as well or whether they're just here for our diamonds or grass or whatever resource it is that think people think that <laughs> Ethi have flown millions of light years to get. Um, and uh, then disengage, of course, if if... Etty are belligerent about one and two, uh, or if they're likely to harm us in the process of of you know just existing, you know they're they're they may require a certain level of radioactive background stuff. I don't know, you know, like War of the Worlds, harmful bacteria kind of story, whatever you want to mention here. So, and that's the, that's the whole point. My, the whole thing here is to say, well, look, let's let's build this list of axioms. So that we're going to be able to 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 not mess up the first contact, and let's do it now, so that we're not scrabbling to do this when when they arrive in orbit, and we're all bashing about trying to figure out philosophy 
resolutions and military resolutions and biological res and all these other kinds of things, which nobody will be able to coordinate because some idiot prime minister or president will be waving his wand around and buttons on fingers on buttons and all that kind of stuff. That's, so that's basically it. And I'll leave you with this end screen. Um, and if the viewers want the QL code in the bottom, we'll take them to my article. And there's obviously more citations in the article. This is, is just for what I've used in the presentation. I so, And thank you for letting me go a little over, Tim. I appreciate your patience. <laughs> Okay, there we go. So yeah, let's get into some of the discussion, the questions that I had kind of prepared. Um, and again, I'm going to play a little bit fast and loose with these. But I guess one of the first things that I want to start with is really a lot of your argument is premised around the model of uh, the SETI style discovery, right? And so we're communicating long distances, and we somehow discover ET, maybe we discover their signals, something along those lines. Um, but I, I should start by addressing kind of the elephant in the room, as it were, which is the UAP phenomena, right? I, I mean, I, no one has outright said that UAP are extraterrestrial, but there is definitely this indication that that may be the case. If that's the case, does that change this model for axioms of first contact? Uh, <clears throat> no. Uh, <laughs> If anything, it sort of justifies the need to get on it, I suppose. Um, yeah, I, the the thing with the UAPs is that <clears throat> they're certainly very, uh, they're definitely in the news at the moment uh, in virtue of random balloons and, and whatever. Um, I have a feeling that the that sort of imminent stuff wouldn't be uh, necessarily extraterrestrial, and and I I think the reason I would say that is because, and this is only me, uh, sort of thinking. But if I were to go and look at some other planet, I wouldn't do it by bouncing balloons or objects in the you know in the in the it, literally in the atmosphere. It would be in orbit, uh, observing sort of uh, remote for for a number of different reasons. One because it's it's not sustainable to to bash about other people's planets um, in terms of being in them, you know, to, to affect them very imminently uh, because it influences the way that they are interacting with the world and negatively disposes them to whatever it is that might be. I mean, look at the way that we've looked at these balloons. We're already very ag aggressive against them. They're not there. They shouldn't be here. They're not they're in the wrong space. They're not acting properly. They're like, you know, we're, we're all very fearful of them before we started, which is exactly the sort of disposition that I was reporting in, in my earlier talk about the Hobbesian trap. This is how, as humans, we react to things and we do it badly. Um, so if I were an alien, which I'm not, but if I were an alien, uh, I, I'd i be doing it sort of in, in if at all, in orbit, you know, and, and sort of um, uh, vicariously. But the <clears throat> the the discussion of UAPs is interesting because it sort of centers uh, our focus on our implicit understanding that this is a very real potential. Like in we we look into this as like oh yeah no this is a real thing it could happen, and yet the academic sort of fraternity is like nah no that's all that's no 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 that's never going to happen because because because. Um, and this is what I'm trying and, and exact. It's interesting that you should met well, interesting that these balloons should have cropped up quite as quickly as they did because our response to them is exactly what was predicted by uh, Jabaria et al. Um, and, and that's exactly the kind of behavior that I'm trying to get away from. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, it, one of the reasons that I mentioned them was you had um, spoken a lot about the Fermi paradox. And I, I believe it's kind of little known, but Enrico Fermi's formulation of the Fermi paradox was actually inspired by a newspaper cartoon in 1950 of a UFO that they were discussing right. over lunch in Los Alamos National Labs. Right. And yeah. so one of the things that I've wondered is, you know, has science, including SETI, including, um, you know, this, this entire search for extraterrestrial intelligence, has it been kind of cherry picking data, right, and trying to 
force first contact into our model of what we think it should look like or work like rather than what may actually be happening. I think <clears throat> this is related to, to your earlier question. I think, I think so. Well, I think there is a lack of broad scale consideration of the potentials because we are so focused on signals in this wavelength of this type from these sorts of planets um, <clears throat> that we don't really consider, we're not considering, you know, we're, <clears throat> excuse me, we are only really considering uh, signal, you know, the signals that come from other, other places. We're not really considering objects within our own solar system and we're not, you know, this thing I mentioned earlier on that whipped in and out of our solar system, we we did no, we, we pointed no remote sensing tackle at that. I mean, it could have been full of yeah. remote uh, probes and remote sensing gear, and we would never have known because we didn't look. Um, and there's a reason for it. I mean, we, we, just, we don't have the resources to go pointing expensive cameras at, at, at various things. And that in and of itself is a problem. We're, we're, we're far happier throwing millions and millions of dollars away on political campaigns and, and lesser practical things. And, and I think uh, the constraints that we have made in virtue of making political applications for funding have constrained those potentials to like the most, what, what, we, what is considered most likely or what we might have the most data for. Uh, but that doesn't reflect the reality of the situation. Like I, like I mentioned, well, I briefly mentioned that some animals navigate the world by use of magnetism, magnetic fields. Um, and uh, it is perfectly reasonable to assume that other species can communicate by localized magnetic field distortions. We have no mechanism of determining those kinds of uh, of. of field distortions as communication. And so when we're just not looking for them, but it doesn't mean that they're not possible. It yeah, means that yeah. we're we're focused on this because we can and because we can interpret them. But but that has nothing to do with the reality of the situation. And and this is part of the it's a part of the gold of creating this list of axioms is to broaden our minds to what what can we actually know about these things? Well we can know these things about these things. And these are nothing like what we're already doing. You have written that the probability of an imminent first contact with extraterrestrial intelligence should be enough to prompt serious debates over the pragmatic, religious, political, and social ramifications of such an occurrence, right? Okay. Now, a, a moment ago, we were talking about the UAP phenomena and whether or not it turns out to be extraterrestrial in nature or some part of it does. Um, one of the things that I've wondered is how come we're not already starting to see this? I believe that something like 38% of the American public believe that UFOs are real and they're extraterrestrial in nature. How come we're not seeing more of that already? You know, and, and again, it, it, this is almost regardless of the reality of it. It's more of what's perceived, right? If the public perceives that these are alien um, shouldn't shouldn't we be seeing these debates start already? Well, there's a, there's a there's a lot of stuff tied up in that. Um, the the first thing I would say is that um, the first thing I would say is that uh, public opinion is at best untrustworthy, um, but indicative of a social disposition towards. Some content or nugget of truth. Uh, the other element is that were such craft identified by governments as being potentially extraterrestrial, the last people that they're going to admit that to is the public because. Uh, well, they don't want to start a panic, right? That would be <laughs> number one. Uh, yeah. Major, yeah, I mean. We we had enough trouble when we had to get inoculated for or vaccinated for, for for COVID. Tell them that there's random ethy floating around in the atmosphere and people will go nuts. Um, and the other reason I think that is relevant is because the the reality of the discourse there's something very there's still something very H.G. Wells Wellian about it. You know, there's 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 
there's something very that's that's not real. It's not going to happen. It's the stuff of fairy tales, which is exactly the point of my opening, my opening line from the Strange New World. We all think it's this dream, this magical sort of dream, uh, until such time as it as they as they appear in the thing, you know. Like, and and it is only then that the 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 real proper debate will occur, you know, because then it is it's provoked, I suppose, in a way that becomes more um, more tangible and more real. But then the philosophical debate will be too late. I mean, the the religious debate and the political debate can 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 happen when it happens. But the political and, and pragmatic response needs to happen before it happens. Yeah. Or else there's going to be no tools to deal with it when it does. And and this is the sort of the problem. So I think, you know, this is a very, you, you mentioned a really interesting thing. And I think part of this is is the reason that it's very difficult to get work on this sort of area published. Because no journal takes you seriously. It, they, 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 you're talking about aliens, aren't you? No, I'm not talking about aliens. I'm talking about policy and protocol that that are relevant to our our broadly philosophical perspective of the universe. It just happens to relate to a potential first contact situation. It's 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 good philosophical, pure philosophical thought. I'm just applying it in a in in a, in a way that will be beneficial to humankind. And you kind of need to move with that ah, no 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 no. that's scary it's about aliens you can't publish that and that's part of the problem so and, and if i can if i can interject um this is something that i've kind of been sensing i could be mistaken about this but um i, I kind of delineate this in terms of intellectual acceptance versus emotional acceptance right and i guess regardless of which approach you know study style or uap um intellectually we have this idea that we are going to discover or we have already discovered, you know, intelligent species outside of the human race. But it seems like there is an emotional acceptance that has yet to come. And maybe that maybe that is what's holding up some of the discussion on this. And the reason I mention that is um, there's also a wild card here, I think, which is artificial intelligence. Right. And I'm sure you've been following the headlines with chat GPT. So. Uh, you know, we have a lot of emerging potential avenues for non-human intelligence, and and it seems like um, this discussion and this discourse um, really applies in many ways to all of them, but it hasn't really happened yet. And I think that maybe that we haven't emotionally accepted that, hey, we're there, we need to deal with this. Uh I, you, you're you're right. I think there is a distinction between. Um, I I I want. I'm not going to call it an emotional response. I understand what you mean, but I'm I'm going to draw the distinction between this kind of academic sort of appropriate research knowledge, uh, and what I would say would be the kind of. Uh, I'm going to use the word hoi polloi, but I don't I don't really mean that in its pejorative sense, but like the kinds of things that other human beings are sort of interested in or treat as sort of knowledge. So there's reliable, dependable academic knowledge, and then there's all sorts of other types of news and magazines and articles and, and public opinion and all these other sorts of things. Uh, and the two are not the, the two are not consistent. It's a shame that one is not more like the other. Uh, and it's it's also a shame that there's not more influence on the academic from the public. Um, so only certain amounts of, of academic research are approved is not the right word, but but sufficiently academic, I suppose. Um, uh, and when you start talking about stuff like first contact with extraterrestrials, that that starts to move away from the scientific related data from what is known to the kind of hypothesis about what might be known. Well, historically, philosophy was, this was the bailiwick of philosophy. That's what we did, was hypothesis about, about the things that we didn't know about. And so uh, it, we're sort of bleeding into this sort of popularist thought and saying, well, what happened? What happens if? Um, and uh, I think that's relevant, but I think it makes it difficult to publish in yeah. terms of, of broadcasting uh, that knowledge in uh, 
not official circles, but, you know, kind of acceptable circles. And I think there's also something relevant about that Area 51 kind of stuff. So we have all of these hearsay or I don't know what you want to call it, popularized myths about Area 51 and alien spacecraft. Well, and yeah, I, I would actually, stuff. I would... I, I call it cultural mythology, and I'm sorry for interrupting, but that's yeah, no, that's a perfect yeah, that's yeah. that's the word that's the word that I use, it, it, cultural mythology, and and I I would say that it's firmly separate from whatever the reality is at this point, right? This dates back seventy years. I mean, but yes. um, you know, people in UFO circles, right? I mean, you've got Kenneth Arnold, and you have a bunch of other stuff back at the beginning, and you move through that, and you've got you know close encounters with Steven Spielberg, and then Bob yes. Lazar in the 80s black triangles in the 90s and these have formed kind of a, a canon of popular mythology right. and it's self-reinforcing right? right and whatever is happening in reality may be completely separate from that or maybe there's overlap maybe it's well, all true I, yeah I I, it, there becomes like this sort of uh almost this you, you use the word mythology and it's a good word but i think it almost becomes more i've watched a number of proper interviews on Area 51 by people who happened to be there at the time. And, you, you know, you listen to that stuff and you're like, oh, that sounds really convincing. I mean, the philosopher in me is like, that, that's not really convincing, but but I listen to the stuff and I'm like, no, no, that's like, that's like yeah, yeah. stuff, you know. And I think that guides uh, popularized thought, but I think it jades academic thought because academic thought wishes to be distanced from Cookie's the wrong word, but that 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 whole ethos, because it doesn't want to fall into the trap whereby it publishes somebody who's pulled apart a spaceship in Area Fifty One. You know, it, like it needs to be rigorous and, and approved. But this stuff sort of migrates into it, you know, and and I think that's a that's a problem. But you mentioned something about like developing religious thought and political thought, and the problem with political thought and I don't just mean like externalized political thought, but internal, underground, hidden, redacted knowledge that I don't suppose has anything to do with Area 51, but does talk about things like military secrets and Russian campaigns and all this, you know, real world stuff. That stuff interferes with political dispositions towards first contact with extraterrestrial intelligence yeah. because they're already geared to a certain level to respond in certain ways because that's what you do when you have aggressive sort of things. And unfortunately, as Plato noted, the kinds of people that happen to be in positions of power are not the kinds of people that you actually want in positions of power in events like that because they're generally completely incapable of dealing with it. Um, and so then it falls to the, the generals and the people who do take responsibility for that, and they have their own agendas. And the the, the real response is sort of the pragmatic and sensible response is lost. Well, you know, it, it, and again, going to this cultural mythology part of it, one of the things that we've picked up from this is, uh, and this goes back to H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds, right? So, um, you know, aliens arrive um you know again either ufos or they they fly here in their star cruisers something along those lines they have ray guns right they outnumber us but if we give them the good fight we can prevail you know right. and every science fiction movie made has something along those lines where there's something that's relatively evenly matched and this this goes to the kind of the hobbesian trap uh, um, which you know you described this disparity in capabilities you know but i i think in terms of the reality of things um it's far easier for et to drop an asteroid on us and just end everything than it is for them to come down with ray guns so it seems like we would want to avoid hostilities at all costs right uh well i mean there, there's there's two there's two assumptions that are relevant here um i, I don't mean your assumptions i mean broad assumptions so the, the first assumption and I hinted to it in the in the, the presentation, is that we assume that they want something. We assume that we have something that is valuable to Ethi. And I I can't be the first one to identify the 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 inanity of that statement. There can be nothing that this planet has that is not available 
from some other planet next door. There's no, there, it's not special. There's no resources that we have here that are special. Uh, the only thing that, that distinguishes us from Saturn or Pluto or whatever else you want to call it is because we have to be on it, but we're not useful. Why would we be useful? We're just a, you think that like, it's not realistic to assume that Etty needs slaves that like, why would you, that's a very human anthropocentric sort of position. They have not, I can't imagine that, that any long lived successful intergalactic species have adapted. So they have slaves. I mean, like, we got rid of them a hundred years ago uh, because we recognized the social calamity that was involved in that. Um, we, we can't like, no. So the, I don't think there's any reason for Etty to be here other than their innate curiosity in a species that's maybe somewhat similar to themselves in terms of advancement. Um, so I don't think that there's any need for a species to go throwing asteroids around or ray guns around or whatever. I think the problem is, and I might be naive, but I think Letty might arrive here because they're interested in us, uh, holding out their hands like uh, like the Vulcan character on my slideshow uh, in friendship, and we get all antsy because that's what we do. And we start throwing nuclear missiles around because we have absolutely no idea how to respond to such a thing. Um, and this is the way that we go about defending our territory. We throw missiles at it until it becomes ours. And this is this is a completely inappropriate response. It's absolutely going to be the response because the idiots that run these sorts of fracas are going to be in control with the hands on the buttons and all this sort of stuff. Um, but in reality, what actually is probably going to what they're looking for, probably Ethi are looking for, is communication. They want to open, like they're interested. They're interested in us. We have, I think. This is becoming very Socratean, but I think that human species have adapted the way we have beyond the way that dinosaurs did, partly because of, of you know being a different branch on the tree of life, but because we're curious. Yeah. And I think that's a fundamental aspect of intellectual capacity. Like you you are intellectual and therefore you become curious and you are curious and therefore you become more intellectual i think that they go they go together etty i think in terms of de in, in virtue of definition will be the same so when they come here they're not looking for a fight they're not slinging ray guns or asteroids around they just want to they just want to enter into a discussion and they want to they want to communicate and learn and, and discover and develop in the way that we would like like me and you would not like military generals would or presidents and prime ministers would who think perhaps about their own i'm being very politically jaded here but um in terms of the benefit what can they do for us who cares what they can do for us it's a, it's a new thing let's go and look at the new thing and so i think the disposition towards what they are is is jaded by this hobbesian diffidence you know we're we're, we're scared of the new thing because it's new yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I completely agree with you. Now, from from my own research and from past interviews that I've done, I, I would tend to agree in terms of E.T. not wanting anything that's here. Um, again, a lot of those ideas of, uh, you know, aliens are here for our women, they're here for our diamonds, they're here for our beer, you know, right. th those things come out of the 20th century, right? And those really come from fears about, like a lot of them were fears of communism. You know, that Hollywood right. picked up and they put into space aliens and zombies and things like that. Um, but once you start to look at what's possible, like in the next hundred years with nanotech, right, um, it, it makes this idea of coming to take something like that absolutely ridiculous. Now, one thing that we do have that, that they would be very interested in is um, our unique biosphere. And I would imagine that there, there are two ways that they would study that. They don't need to abduct people to take that. You could just take samples of DNA and recreate it. And I, I would imagine that, you know, if if UAP are extraterrestrial, part of what they might be doing is sample collection. Another thing that it seems like is very valid is just, um, you know, in vitro study, right? And so maybe that would explain these craft banging around in the atmosphere as you've described them. 
perhaps that's just in vitro study you know how do these how do these animals on this planet that we've discovered behave well we'll just fly around with cameras although that being said your your comment about orbital discovery makes a lot of sense you you really wouldn't want to disturb right you wouldn't want to be observed and taken seriously and stuff like that you would just kind of want to stay out of the way and do your best to kind of understand what's going on and i i completely agree with you about curiosity as a motive you know i wrote a paper a number of years ago about uh about social science qualitative research um and I can't even remember the title of it now. Uh, published uh, published in a journal somewhere, something about interaction, social science interaction, and it and it took uh, uh, an, an an observation that was made in the Star Trek movie, Star Trek Insurrection, uh, in which the Federation was uh, on a planet observing anthropologically the primitive but up-and-coming species um, cloaked so that they couldn't be seen. And, I mean, you could you can talk about cloaking tech, but I, this, this moves a lot into sort of more social science fiction-related stuff rather than social science-related stuff. But the reality is that you can't successfully observe any species if you're there. And anthropologists know this. So the, the closer you get to being... A direct observer of a of a yeah. of a system, the more interference you have and the less accurate your data is. Now, assuming there are a couple of other things to assume, assuming that uh, Etty are interested in us uh, as a species, as a biological diversity uh, and a biosphere, uh, they don't they don't want to insert themselves into that because they'll spoil the data, and they have the capacity to record the data without spoiling it. Because if you've got the ability, the technological advancement to send from wherever you are to us a relatively hidden craft of some description of it, you are going to be able to you're going to be able to resolve that planet um, better than we are. We can already here's an interesting thing uh, that's related to our actual capacity from sp- satellites in space. I know this because I deal with the man that makes them. We can resolve a bat in a tree mm-hmm. at night, right? This is the level of remote sensing we have. Yeah. We have. Now, if you've got an Etty that's capable of pushing a spacecraft 10, 20, 30 light years across space to observe us, you can guarantee that it's capable of resolving bats in trees uh, and at nighttime, right? Because we can. So the question is not about, what do the, you know about Ethi being on the, on the planet or in the atmosphere? That that makes no sense. It's not anthropologically sensible. It spoils the data. It's not practical because there's a whole bunch more complexity in getting a, a spacecraft in the orb in in the atmosphere than out of it because there's shielding and disruption and cloaking and all that. No, it's nonsense. None of that is going to happen. They're going to sit around in orbit with their super gadgets and and photograph bats in trees because that's that's what you do um because that's the sensible way forward so so i think that this is a sort of a you know we we i think the ontology of this is because of our fear i think these science fiction programs and i love science fiction so i'm the last person that's going to sit here and criticize it but it is a bit it is a bit Independence Day, isn't it? It's a bit Will Smith it's, punching it's, some alien in the face because we can. It's it's a bit histrionic. It's a bit. It's it's exactly what happened in Contact, not Contact, in Arrival, uh, which demonstrated that a, a fourth dimensional species came here to warn us to stop being idiots, uh, and us reacting in a completely inappropriate way, killing some of them, uh, but becoming better anyway. And it's like this this science fiction overarching become better thing. The reality is that the world and the universe doesn't actually work like that. There are, you know, I mean, you can talk about anthropological studies of people going to study tribes and pick your yeah. evolving country, but that's not how we do it. You know, that's, we don't 
zoom things into just we we do it carefully with with ethical constraints and we observe carefully and and you know so that's my thoughts on no i i again yeah i i agree with you i love science fiction as well i'm a tremendous science fiction fan but you know but at the same time i think that that we have to recognize and definitely from an academic perspective i think it is recognized that um you know science fiction is really a, mostly about morality tales that are told yes. you know by humans for humans conveying human right. social norms and cultural standards yeah. and have very little to do with extraterrestrials so no, um, I, I, and and there's also this uh, there's this deep seated element of of fear of the unknown that's in yeah. there, and then the necessary epic story of overcoming that. So they have to weave this narrative that isn't actually a narrative that exists in real life because they have to make it you know they've got to make it attractive and interesting. Um, but uh, it it also affects the way that the world perceives the extraterrestrial stuff because it's because it's sort of pre-programmed to hate the borg and love the vulcans yes. and the, the green lady species whatever that is because that's what we that's what we do right um the reality of of i say the reality i i, I believe based upon the kinds of evidence that you and i have read that the indicative thinking would demonstrate that they are not dangerous and out for our women or beer um but yeah you know, i mean we do make a good pint so who knows <laughs> well steve on that note let me thank you so much for your time today and thank you for the presentation as well it, it's been a tremendous honor to have you present all of this and i know how much material this is and how long this put to, you know took to put together so let me close by asking in terms of first contact i want to take things full circle back to this idea of having a framework in place to handle first contact and i guess my my thought that i would close on is um again even if uap are extraterrestrial um we are bound to encounter more species along the way as our sensors get better as our data processing gets better even if we've already encountered one and somehow miraculously involved not you know miraculously not killed ourselves yeah it, it seems like as time passes we will probably encounter more and more and more extraterrestrial species um isn't isn't it likely that uh, you know, we'll encounter these, and shouldn't we have a framework in place for first contact that we will probably use not just once, but countless times? There, there's three points that I want to address there that that's that that I think I need to stress. Um, the first thing is that I, I'm not very good with probabilistics and probability, but I I don't see. I don't see there being any more likelihood of identifying remotely what I call distally an Eti species um, than there is it, it flying into orbit. And I'll explain why. That we have created the technology to identify exoplanets and are now developing the technology to know more about those exoplanets and thus maybe identify life uh, does not in any way stop some other Eti who has already identified us from recognizing us as an interesting species and coming here to look at us. There's a good chance that if we found existence of life at, on some exoplanet, we would make some attempt to go and look at it because that's the kind of people we are. So I don't see that there's any more likelihood of a, of a, a remote first contact, a distal first contact, than there is a proximal first contact. I, it's just uh, that there's no reason to suppose that that would be the case assuming things about the Drake equation and, and so on and so forth that are relevant. Um, the, the second element to that is that uh, while discovering distally first contact means that we have way more time to prepare in meaningful ways for that contact, and I don't just mean prepare for the potential of a signal, but having received signal and thus presumably starting to engage in some form of discourse, however you might write that, 
uh, there's a process because it takes 20 years or 40 years or however many years to beam a, a thing there. But we're not even looking at sig sig we are not even looking at the mechanism by which we can broadcast signal appropriately. So instead of looking at faster, instead of looking at speed of light communications, we're still beeping out radio signals because we think that's the way to go. This is not the way to go because it's it's, it's far slower to get anything anywhere, obviously, for in radio than it is in light, um, <clears throat> and much less effective. And so we should really be looking at technologies that permit long-distance communications from which we can then develop some sort of communication. I mean, we're talking about, I mentioned this in the paper, generational endeavors. You know, these are these are things that you and I are leaving for our kids and our grandkids um, because we're not going to be here to see it, unfortunately, well, unless they pop up. We're not going to be able to, to see it. And that brings me on to the third point, which is we have time to develop a protocol for first contact distally because we have the, the time to identify the signal and then think about how to send a signal back and how to code a signal and what sort of signal we should send back and how to hurl golden records at planets a long way away, you know, all these kind of stuff. But we need to start thinking about the kinds of mechanism that Etty might use to sense the world around them rather than just assume that they do it visually or within certain spectra so that they can identify. I mean, if we start, literally, if we start hurling golden records about there's there's no reason to assume that they can identify the golden record as a thing anyway, because it's not like, I mean, they have to interpret the world in some way, but it doesn't necessarily need to be our way. So this kind of, thinking this this non seti thinking without beating seti up on their protocol likelihood and potentials and probability for picking these things as they do we have to consider we have to consider the alternative mechanisms and the and the the magnitude by which those things uh exist those sensory things exist and by what means we can you know we're looking for beeps on the radio spectrum. And we should be looking for much more fundamental things like power generation, signals of power generation. And I don't just mean from a power generation, but like we should be, we should be looking to resolve a, a sort of a, a, a mission that would identify when power is being generated by not natural means or localized power generation or heat distributions or these kinds of things, not BP signals on the radio wavelength. And the last point is that the whole purpose of this thinking is because we need to have a much broader, I believe, we need to have a much better protocol for first contact, one that exceeds my four point, whatever it is that I've, I've put up there, something that's a bit more substantial, something that says, well, you know, if we do get a proximal or distal first contact you know how, how does our response differ for each uh if it's proximal you know what are our what are our what kinds of pro what kinds of things do we need to prioritize and how do we begin that communication process how do we identify the mechanism by which we are to communicate how do i take the species that from what we know of the species so this big blob appears in the sky. We know it's extraterrestrial. How do I think about the kinds of mechanisms that that entity might communicate on? This is part of the policy. And it's not being looked at because nobody is, you know, everybody thinks it's all science fiction stuff. It isn't. It's philosophy. It's philosophy and science. It's what we do. It's our job. Like Seneca, a very, very long time ago, Seneca criticized philosophers for sitting about debating language use instead of being actually practical and helping people in need. Well, this is a need. We have a need. We've got, this is a thing. It might happen. It might happen tomorrow. And here we are complaining about God knows whatever we are as philosophers, you know, bashing about language use. And, and, and I mean, it's relevant stuff, but it's not, a, it's not, it, it, all it does is constrain things inappropriately sometimes. And what we need to be looking at is we need to have research saying, thinking about, the spectrum of communication, how it can be, how it can be identified. You know, if I take this object, how do I know how to uh, how to communicate with it? By what mechanism, or what process 
Do I interpret this entity, this thing, this physical thing, such that I can begin to assess how it communicates? That's a philosophical discourse. The sciencey stuff comes later, but the process is philosophical. And here we are sitting around whining about whatever it is that we're whining about in, in philosophy. Nothing useful. As a practical philosopher, I get quite irritated by it because the, I'm going on a political rant here, but the neoliberal society doesn't like philosophy because it scares them. And instead of scaring them in a good way, we're scaring them in a bad way and boring them to death. And we should be sitting here saying, no, this is interesting stuff. Here's my thoughts on this. Here you go. And we're not because we're scared and because the journals aren't interested in it and, and or are scared about publishing it. And you don't develop policies and protocols and, and positive ameliorations if if nothing happens, if everybody's scared of talking about something or nobody's actually doing the, the fundamental groundwork, you know, and this groundwork yeah, the, the that groundwork I'm trying to do is, is the point. Steve, on that note, let me thank you once more for your time today, sir. Thank you very much for having me on. It's, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. I do appreciate the time you've taken with me today. And uh, and I also I mentioned this earlier on, but I really do appreciate your wall art. So, Thank you again. Thanks very much, Tim.